I hope you won't begrudge me for doing this. Good morning, members of Beacon Light Church. <laughs> you know I love you. I'll be back soon. The members of Beacon Light were so full of love that they loved me back from my stroke, from the loss of my wife to cancer. And uh, I'll never forget them for it. We, we have a love affair that's going on and on and on and on, and I hope it never stops. Amen. Hope you have a great worship service today. Get somebody else to preach. You don't have to look at me. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I didn't think I'd be back here, but you knew. No, thank you, Father. I thank you. I thought it was all over. But you gave me another chance. And I appreciate it. So today, all that I have and all that I am, I place into your hands again. I promised you when I was flat on my back in the rehab center that if you'd give me breath, I'd keep on preaching. You've given me breath, so I'm trying to honor my, my part of the bargain. Oh, all I need is for you to help me, because I can't do it on my own. So I thank you for your blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Folk, we have an amazingly difficult job ahead of us. I wish I could bring you one of those happy, pat you on the back messages, but it's too late. Time is almost gone, and we've got a job to do. And some of us act like it's as if this is business as usual. It is not. The world has changed in the last few years, and it's changing as I speak. And it's not getting better. It's getting harder and colder. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, in fact, it, it gives us actually a fast description of what's happening. There was a time when people liked to listen to the Word of God. That time is gone. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's what has happened. But our job has not changed. Situations have changed, but God expects us to tell people about his love before it's too late. Amen. And uh, I like the job, but it's just getting more difficult. People don't want to hear it anymore. Their minds are on something else. In fact, they did a survey not many years ago and found out that there's only one language that works all around the globe. And that language is the language of the hip-hop culture. Everybody knows that one. People don't understand pastors or teachers anymore. It's as though we're speaking a foreign language. But I know a God who on the day of Pentecost gave a gift to his followers so that everybody could hear them in their own language. I don't recommend that we learn to speak hip-hop. I just tell you that what's going to happen is God is going to let us talk and he will translate our words into words that they can understand. Amen. I'm one of those people who believes that the miracle at Pentecost was not a miracle of speaking, but a miracle of hearing. And um, I don't have any doubt that, that we can talk to those who don't think they understand us because the Holy Spirit will give them the ability to understand the truth from our mouths. And I look forward to sharing it with them. Well, how about you? Amen. God has been so good to me that I want to tell everybody. Amen. And I do. I was, I was at my church one Sabbath, and um, one of my leftover problems from my stroke came to me, and uh, I, um, I actually couldn't go on with my sermon. I had to stop. Somebody in the church called the uh, paramedics, and they came to get me, and I said, no, you can go ahead now. And 
The guy said, well, no, I got to take you. I said, well, somebody beat you here, and I'm doing fine. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, I understand what you mean, Pastor, but I got to do my job. My wife will tell you that on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, I told him about my faith, what I believed, and about the Holy Sabbath. And um, he got interested in that short ride. He said, I'm going to come back to your church. I said, I'll, I'll make you keep that promise. I don't know whether he's been back, but any Sabbath he comes, I'm ready for him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So our job is difficult, but it's not impossible. Right. People have gotten cold-hearted. There used to be a time when they wanted to hear truth. Now they want to hear anything but truth. However, you and I have a promise. And the promise that God has made to us lets me know that we're going to be able to do the job that he left for us. Our job is described in Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. We can't go home until we've told everybody about Jesus. But to me, that doesn't represent a challenge so much as a joy. I love to talk about Jesus. Amen. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. Amen. And so if, if you give me a few minutes, I'll start weaving him in, into the conversation because I love to talk about him. And I believe, my friends, that the only way in this difficult culture that we're going to be able to keep that, that job is by calling for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Ellen White says that too often we don't pray for the Holy Spirit. Right. But um, I want to say to my friends, Pastor Jim Gilley and to, and to my friend Danny Shelton, this camp meeting, I believe, is history. It's a part of history. I think we are at a change point. I've heard some sermons here with such wonderful content that they are the best I've ever heard. And I think this camp meeting is going to make a difference in the culture of our church. In fact, I believe when we look back on it in a few years, we're going to say that was the beginning. That's when we started changing. And the one thing that I believe will change is that we're going to experience the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Amen. We don't have the power today to do what we need to do, but God is holding the power, more willing to give it to us than a father is to give a good gift to his child. All we've got to do is ask. And I think it's time for us to start changing our prayers and asking for the gift of the latter rain so that we can do what we promised God we would. And I believe that this camp meeting is a turning point in our church's history. I think that things will change because when you go home, you're going to pray for the Holy Spirit. I know you are. You couldn't come here and stay this long and go home unchanged. It's going to happen. And I believe when we look back after we see Jesus coming, somebody's going to remember and say, remember camp meeting? 2014? Yeah, I do. I think that was the point where we started getting right. Yeah, me too. So 3ABN, you are part of a history-making change, and I'm happy that I'm your friend so I could be here. I never thought I'd be on television again, but that shows how much I know. I'm just willing to go wherever God leads. So I know that it is challenging these days. There are some people who are indifferent to God, some people who are, who are turned against God, some people who are in rebellion against God. But when the Holy Spirit is poured out in latter rain power, we're going to be able to reach all of them because the power of the Holy Spirit can touch hearts and change them. I know that because God has allowed me to preach the gospel around the world in every inhabited continent, 
and 69 countries and island nations of the sea. I've been to some places I never thought I'd even know, but I preach the gospel. In fact, I say often that I wish I could take before and after pictures because I've met people I couldn't speak their language, but I could look at their faces and tell something about them. But when they got through hearing the Word of God, they didn't look the same. The Word of God will change you. Amen. So before you go out and get your facelift, <laughs> get in the Word of God real deep. Amen. Let Jesus do a job on you. Amen. And it won't cost you anything. Amen. The cost for your facelift is already paid. Amen. And when you look at Jesus' love again, you'll look better. Yes. I promise you. And you won't have to go back again and get it adjusted. Because <laughs> Jesus adjusts it every day. Amen. Amen. Amen? That's what we've got to be about, folks. We've got to be about our Father's business. Amen. Spreading this word all over the world. And you know and I know that 3ABN is a big part of that because what we have experienced here at Camp Meeting has gone already around the world. There are people who have heard everything you've heard. Now my question is, what are you going to do about it? There's some folk who heard it the first time this week, and they're going to do something about it. How about you? You look like you're ready to do something. One of my friends who is a pastor of another denomination said to me, you know, Pearson, your people look so intelligent. They look like they're really on top of things. He said, but sometimes I've found out that even though my people don't look as intelligent, they're ready to go to work for Jesus right now. Amen. Your folks just kind of sit there and look intelligent. <laughs> and the reason why I hated that remark is because I found it to be true. God has blessed us so much that we look like we could do anything. And some of us just sit there and look like we could do anything. It's time for us to stop sitting looking like we could do anything and by the power of the Holy Spirit, do anything. Do everything. Because as soon as that's over, then the end will come and we'll go back home to live with Jesus. The Bible says, The eye seeing seeth not, the ear hearing heareth not what God has prepared for His children. But if you read that text real carefully, it says, But the Spirit tells us a few things. Every now and then, I hear God talking about what heaven is going to be like. Well, I'll tell you what, a, a hint, there is a hint. If Jesus could make earth in six literal days, and it'd be so beautiful, what do you think heaven's going to be like? He's been working on it for 2,000 years. Amen. I want to be there. Amen. I've heard one interpretation that we're going to have resting places, mansions, that's okay with me. I think I could deal with a mansion, especially one that doesn't have a mortgage. <laughs> then another interpretation says that in my father's house, there are many rooms. And I like that one because that means I'll be down the hall from Jesus. Be down the hall from you too, probably. So if you don't love me today, you better adjust. Because you're going to be down the hall from me. You'll run into me just about all the time. We had better learn how to love each other. What do you say? Amen. So we have a job to do. We don't have the power to do it, but God has the power holding for us, and it's time for us to start praying sincerely that God will pour out His Spirit on us because the Holy Spirit can do anything. There's nothing that the Holy Spirit can't do. And God is willing, more willing to give the Holy Spirit than we are to ask. And let's stop our reluctance. Let's get our power. What do you say? Amen. I have done meetings where I wished for power. Many times I go to a new city and the people have already said, Pastor, when you get here, we're going to have a big crowd for you. And I go to a big auditorium that holds about 20,000 20, people and sitting in front of me about 20 people. Now I've learned something. I don't get disturbed 
because I know what the Holy Spirit can do. So I just start praying about it. And God will take those 20 and multiply them. So that every night, instead of getting smaller, that number gets larger. And God will eventually, through the power of His Spirit, fill the place up. And I've learned that. So when I see an empty auditorium doing evangelism, I'm not disturbed. I'm just excited about what I'm about to see. Because I know God, in His own way, in His own time, will fill the place up. There are times when I've come to the end of an evangelistic meeting and didn't have enough people who had already decided to be baptized, and I'd say, oh, no, we're in trouble. We're not going to have enough people. Then I remember who I work for. All I did was ask God, turn the Holy Spirit loose in this place. And instead of having a small baptism, overnight God would change the terrain and we'd have a baptism that was unbelievably large because the Holy Spirit changes hearts. I have been in the place where thousands of people have been baptized, but I came to know I was never the one who changed anybody's heart. No word of mine has ever changed anybody to believe in Christ. The only power that does that is the power of the Holy Spirit. But God is my Father, and God sends the Holy Spirit. So all I've got to do when I get in a jam is call Daddy. Tell him what I need. And he dispenses the power, and it gets done. So I thank God that I've started off in some small places with a small crowd, but God makes a difference. And I know that if you and I would start doing what God calls on us to do and asking for the Holy Spirit's power, we would do amazing things. That tiny little Bible study that you start in your house will get so big that you can't hold it in your house. Those two people who come every time will start adding and multiplying and adding and multiplying until you won't have room in your house. They'll squeeze out of your living room into your den, into your bedroom. And you'll wonder, what are we going to do? And God will make a place for them. But more than that, he'll make power for them so that they will come to know Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, having been through this, that the greatest joy in the universe is to watch somebody's eyes light up when they come to love Jesus Christ. There is nothing else like it in the universe. No greater thrill, no greater joy. In fact, when that has happened, you won't be impressed by much because when that light comes on in their eyes, I started off not as a pastor but a Bible worker. And uh, I had some wonderful experiences talking to people who started off saying, I've never heard of you folks before. And I tell them, you don't need to hear about us. You need to hear about Jesus. And by the time we got through studying the Word of God, those eyes would change. There's something that happens in their eyes that they don't have to say. In fact, they can be saying, no, I don't want to be a part of this. Shaking their heads this way. But I look in their eyes and I see that light come on. I say, you sure you're not going to be a part of this? No, I'm not going to do it. But the light says, yes. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? It's something interesting to see. But let me, let me quit bugging with you. I came here for a reason, and the reason was to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit to get our job done. The question is, can we do this job? The answer is, by ourselves, no. We can't do it. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then shall the end come. Now, I don't know how in love you are with where you live. Some of you are doing pretty well. I can look at you and tell. I've learned to study body language. You can't tell me you're broke because I can watch you and tell how you walk. I know how poor people walk. <laughs> and I know how people walk who've got a little bit of something in the bank. You folks are in good shape. Of course, I had a, I had a hint in the parking lot. But you know who you are. <laughs> and I'll tell you this. We're going to get this job done. I am not pleased with this world anymore. I've been to some very nice places preaching the gospel. 
In fact, you wouldn't imagine that I've been to such nice places just preaching the Word of God. I've slept in a bed made of pure gold. Didn't sleep well. <laughs> I was wondering, would anybody try to steal the bed? <laughs> I've seen some wonderful places, been in some beautiful houses, had some good food, but I don't like the earth anymore. It's not my home. I'm losing my fascination with it. And I'm ready to move to my real home. I'm ready to go to my mansion or my room down the hall from Jesus. And if we get this work done, we can go. I like you and I'm glad to meet you here, but I'd rather meet you down the hall from Jesus. So what do you say? Let's get this work done. You can't do it by yourself, but ask for your help. Call our Father and ask Him for the power to help. And when we do that, we're going to get this job done. You'll have a great time doing it, and when it's over, we can go home to live with Jesus. And I want to do it. How about you? Amen. Praise God. So then, we know that we don't have the power, but we know that the power is available. And God will, He'll be happy to send the Holy Spirit to give us all the power that we need so that you can see that light come on in their eyes. It's a beautiful sight. And I've seen thousands of people do it, and I never get used to it. I get excited every time. And I, I hope to do it quite a few more times, but I'm about ready to get to the end of it now because I'm ready to go to my new home. Amen? Amen? And the good news is that you and I have another home. Amen. We're just kind of hanging out here. Amen. We're here to do a job, but as soon as the job is done, we got somewhere to go. Amen. We got places to go and people to see. And I'm about ready for it, and I believe this camp meeting has brought us closer to it, and I'm excited about it. Amen. I thank God for 3 ABN and the plans that God gave to them and what it's done for us. I'm excited about doing the job and going back home to live with Jesus. And I hope you are too. So today, let's make up in our minds that we can't do this job by ourselves, but we've got help. And it's about time for us to call for help. Now, I'm a good guy to tell you about that because I got introduced to the Holy Spirit in a kind of different way. I preached my first sermon when I was 13. I'm, I'm a little older than that now. <laughs> the MB Society, you remember that, don't you? Had some great plans. They were thinking outside the envelope. And they said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to go to the prison with the prison band, and one of us ought to speak to the prisoners. And I was listening and wondering how that was going to turn out. And they talked about it and talked about it. Finally, they said, well, who will speak to him? I said, well, you know, I think, I think Walter ought to be the one. Because they had already said this was not a regular prison. I can't remember the exact term, but they said either medium or maximum security prison. And I thought that meant that there were real criminals there. So I didn't want to be the one to speak to them. But they finally took a vote, and I was the one. So I talked to my father. I said, Dad, can you get me out of this? He said, no, nah, I'm not going to get you out of this. I'm glad they told you. I'm glad they chose you. I said, but Dad, these folks, these are criminals. I don't want to speak to criminals. I'm afraid of them. He said, but well, you don't have to be afraid of them. Well, here's how it went. We got in cars and went out to the prison. When we got there, they were finishing up a baseball game. They were in the bottom of the ninth, and they were all excited. There were people all around cheering, and the warden came out and said, we're going to stop the game now. We've got a, got a young man who's going to preach to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tell him to go home. We don't want to go home. I said, Dad, you hear them? They're mad already. <laughs> he said, son, you don't have to worry about that. You just do what God told you to do. And I remember going into that room 
wasn't a beautiful room, wasn't quite this big, but it was this full. And I remember my knees actually smiting each other. <laughs> you folk talk about it all the time, but you never had it happen. I was so frightened, my knees actually hit each other. And I stood up before them and began my sermon at 13. It wasn't much of a sermon. In fact, I can't remember what I said. <laughs> but while I was saying it, six criminals got up and started walking towards me. I turned around. My dad was sitting on the podium behind me. And I went back to him and I said, Dad, look, I told you. See, I told you this wasn't going to be good. Uh, I look at them. They're, they're coming after me. He said, son, go ask any one of them why they're coming. I said, but I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> These guys could be murderers. They could be anything. He said, just go ask one of them. And I took all the nerve I had. I went to one of the guys who had gotten to the front. And I said, hey, how you doing, man? Um, why'd you come up here? He said, I want you to introduce me to Jesus. Because I want my life changed. And I, I couldn't understand why that had happened, but I've discovered since that it happened because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And every evangelistic meeting I've ever run, I've reminded myself of what happened when I was 13. Because I couldn't do it, don't even know what I said, but I do know that they started coming down to the front without being called because I didn't have to call them. The Holy Spirit had called them. Amen. And it's been like that for me for all of these years that I've been in the ministry. 44 years in the ministry. And it's been over and over and over again. I've seen the Holy Spirit change hearts and draw people to Jesus. We don't have to worry about anything in the future. Because we know the power of God's Holy Spirit. So I guess I'm the right one that they chose for today. Because I know about the power. I know, I know what it is to be afraid. I know what it is to think you don't have enough power. But I know what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in and everything is changed. It's a changer when it happens. I've been through the experience and I know what it feels like to have somebody who you're afraid of say, introduce me to Jesus. And it's a great joy. And you and I will experience that great joy as we come to the end of time, and you and I will also be agents used by the Holy Spirit to draw people to Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a wonderful experience to do that. But oh, what a joy it'll be when the end comes. When Jesus comes to, comes to save us, when, when the sky passes away with a roar, and we look up and see clouds no more, but see Jesus coming in clouds. He will not touch the earth, but he'll just suspend there, first calling the dead in Christ to arise from their graves, and they will meet with Jesus. And you know, I've heard some gospel songs that say, if you get there before I do. That's good gospel music, but bad theology. <laughs> Nobody's going to get there before you do. We're going to all meet Jesus on the cloud and there we'll be with him and take that trip with him back to glory where Jesus will swing that gate open wide and we'll go in to be with him forever and ever and ever. The song says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. No more getting old. Amen? Amen. Now, some of you have been very kind since I've been here. You said, oh, Elder Pearson, you look as young as you did before. And I thank you for that kindness. But it turns out that I have mirrors at home. <laughs> and I know that on earth, you look older. I, don't want, I won't make you say amen to that because it might put a crunch in your Sabbath. <laughs> but I know that I look older 
I've got some new wrinkles and some new creases. But uh, as long as I'm serving the Lord and doing the best I can to obey Him, the Lord makes up for the creases. He, he lets them fall in the right place. In fact, He even makes my gray hair look graceful. My barber offered a few weeks ago to dye my hair. I said, no, nah, I work too hard for that gray hair. <laughs> Leave it. Because when you know Jesus, all that stuff that happens doesn't make you look worse. Makes you look better. Amen. I met some dear saints who, who were very old, but they didn't look tired. They didn't, didn't look old. They looked, they looked very uh, gentrified. They looked even wealthy. And they looked like they were settled in Christ. Amen. So I thank you for being kind to me, but I know what I look like. And I know, I know both sides of reality. I do, I do look older, but I do look better. Because in all these years, I've tried to follow Jesus. And when you follow him, he takes care of the wrinkles, the gray hair, the hair that falls out, and all of that. Amen? Amen. So you can look in the mirror and say, well, you know, for a guy my age, uh, uh, all right. Okay. But our job is simple, and we need to get to it. We need to stop having internecine quarrels. People in God's church ought not be quarreling with each other. Amen. Not only do we not have the time to quarrel with each other, but we don't have the resources to quarrel with each other. You ought to be using all of that to talk about Jesus. Amen. I remember one day I went to get my car repaired. And you know how it is. You want to make them think you know what they're doing. So I went, I went back into the bay with the man who was repairing my car, and I got under the car with him, and I was looking at him like I knew what he was doing. Didn't have a clue. <laughs> and something awful happened. He said, Sir, uh, while you're back here, I, I was wondering, do you know Jesus? I said, Yes, I do. In fact, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He said, Well, I was going to tell you if you hadn't met Jesus, I know him, and I was willing to introduce you to him. And I said, oh, no. How could he beat me to that? <laughs> I'm back here acting like I understand what he's doing with my car and missed the opportunity. And he got me first. He said, it's wonderful. I've known Jesus for a week now, and every day is better than the last. <laughs> I said, well, man, let me tell you something. You just, you just messed me up because I should have been telling you that because I've known Jesus for a long time and I let you beat me to the punch. He said, well, you got to be faster because <laughs> I'm excited. And if you're excited about Jesus, you are fast, aren't you? You tell everybody about Jesus. And um, I thank God for the opportunity to do that. There are some people who think this job can't be done. They think we ought to give up on it. But friends of mine, this job is already done. The Lord has made it happen so. There are people who are just waiting. Somebody in your neighborhood is waiting on you to come and talk to them about learning who Jesus is. Now, you don't know who it is, or else I guess you'd have been to them. And you think they don't know Jesus. But people don't need to put signs on their faces or on their chests. There are people in your neighborhood who may not act like they know Jesus, but they do. You let them get in a pinch and see who they call. You may think that they're an atheist, but when they get in trouble, they call Jesus. Oh, Lord. Lord. And they're just waiting on you to come and tell them what you know. In fact, I was surprised when I read years ago that when Jesus comes, there are going to be people who lived not far from us who are going to come to us and say, you knew this all the time? 
Did you know this? You knew he was coming? You knew that we were going to have an opportunity to go to heaven? And you didn't tell me? What kind of neighbor are you? How could you keep this to yourself? And I wonder too, how can you keep this to yourself? If you get a good deal on a car, you tell all your friends. If you get some good groceries at a, a good price, you tell all your friends. How can you keep the knowledge about Jesus to yourself? It's the best thing that's ever happened to you. How can you keep it to yourself? Folk, we've got a job to do, but it's not a hard job. It's a job that's wonderful to do. I thank God for letting us be a part of it. And I, I thank God today for being able to talk to you about it because I never thought I'd be on a stage like this again. But here I am. I'm not as young as I was. I don't move as fast. You remember I was the guy who was all across the, the stage. You, you remember that, don't you? Well, I, while that lasted, it was okay. But the power was never in the moving across the stage. The power was in the Holy Spirit. And I've dedicated myself back to the Lord. And I think that God has put in my mouth at least as much power as I ever had to tell the truth about Jesus. I can't move across the stage anymore, but sitting right here in this one spot, I can do pretty good with the help of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us can do pretty good with what we have. And it is my plea to you today that you stop doing business as usual, that you let this camp meeting be a change point. I've heard some sermons here that made me rethink everything. And I've decided that when I get back home, I'm going to be different. So I hope the members of my church are still listening, because when I get back, you're going to think I'm out of my mind. <laughs> I got programs for you that you won't believe, because we got work to do, folks. The people in Annapolis, Maryland have got to know Jesus, and we are the ones who need to tell them. So we're going to do it, and I'm going to be, I'll get on your nerves a little bit, but I'd rather get on your nerves than to be outside of God's plan. So uh, be ready for me to get on your nerves, and I hope you get over it. <laughs> but if you don't, uh, God says, I've got a power for you. And the power is like Jesus described to Lord Nicodemus. There are people who have studied the Bible who believe that Jesus told Lord Nicodemus more in that one conversation that they had by night than he told anyone else. And he told Nicodemus about how the wind blows where it wants to blow. You can't see it but you can see what it does. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going, but you can tell what it did. I, I was once in an evangelistic meeting in a little town called Xenia, Ohio. Xenia had had a, a tornado and uh, it tore the place apart. I came a year later and put up my tent and I was wondering why everybody was so nervous standing outside but uh, one of my workers said, you know, did you know, Pastor, when you chose this place, uh, they had a tornado last year? I said, I guess I did. I said, well, I don't think they're going to come in here. Well, they did. God's power is more magnetic than the fear of a tornado. So eventually they did come in. Then one night, the wind started blowing really hard. And uh, this is going to sound funny, but it's not a joke. Trust me. I was standing there and I said, well, I need to calm my folks down. So I, I got my best voice up, sounding my most authoritative. And I said, folks, you don't have anything to worry about because Jesus can calm the wind. Yeah. And uh, some of their eyes were still big. So I said, don't you believe that he has the power? But they didn't change. They were still looking afraid. Just about that time, the back of my tent, the podium, the back of the podium hit me across my shoulders. And they say the next week, the pastors in the area had a wonderful time 
talking about that guy who thinks he knows Jesus, but his own tent beat him up. <laughs> well, let me tell you the rest of the story. After that, everybody in my tent ran except my wife and my Bible counselor. People ran out of the tent, and I waited until they came back, and when they did, they said, Pastor, let's, let's take the tent down. I said, no, we're not taking the tent down. He said, well, why don't you take it down? Nobody's going to come in here. The tent hit you. And if it'll hit you, they think it'll hit them. I said, well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's keep on with telling the truth and let God handle the weather. Amen. So I said, here's the rule we'll make. Any night that someone comes to hear the truth, we'll have a meeting. If nobody comes, we won't. Well, some nights, only one inebriated man. And that's just a $20 word to mean drunk. <laughs> He'd come every night. And the folk said, Pastor, you, he doesn't understand what you're saying. He's drunk. I said, yeah, but we made a rule. If anybody comes, we, we'll keep on having the meetings. And that man came almost every night, so we had to keep on having meetings. Sometimes he was the only one in the tent. And they'd say, Pastor, come on. We, we, we'll forgive you if you stop tonight. Let's go home. We can go home and relax. I said, no, I'm going to keep my word to the Lord. And we ran in that meeting, sometimes week after week, with only one person in that tent. But when we got to the end, something amazing happened. I had run a meeting uh, just a few miles away the year before, in another city, and there were some people who had heard the word, who had heard the gospel, but they were not baptized. On the Sabbath that we had designated for baptisms, when I was going to call for decisions, my, my staff told me again, Pastor, you don't have to try to impress us. We know you're, you're dedicated. Let's just take this tent down. I said, no, let's see what God can do. While I was preaching on that day, I saw some cars pull up, and people got out of those cars who I recognized. Almost every one of them who got out had been to the meeting that I had held the year before. They already knew the truth. They just hadn't made up their minds quickly enough. And 21 people came into that tent who had already heard the message, who hadn't made up their minds. And I made an appeal to the one drunk man and the 21 others who already knew what I preached. And the 21 people decided to be baptized. So out of a meeting with one drunk man coming, we baptized 21 people. The most... <laughs> the most precious 21 I've ever baptized. There have been meetings when I baptized a whole lot of other folks, but none more precious than these because they weren't there. But while I was preaching, in faith, they came. I don't know how they heard. I don't know how they knew I was running another meeting, but they came, and they decided to be baptized. And God taught me another lesson. If you just do what I tell you, I'll make it right. Amen. Let me handle the results. You just do what I say. Amen. Is there anybody in this room who knows that works? Amen. Praise God. And I've learned that over and over again. But we have not seen the greatest days yet. I ran a meeting in a little town called Tema, Ghana, in West Africa. And I got the best response that I've ever gotten in one meeting. Well, maybe not. I'll tell you about the other one. But 600 people decided to be baptized. 600 now, the, the, the church that I was having the meeting for had, I think, 15 members. And we, we were about to baptize 600. So figure that out. How do you do the right hand of fellowship when you got 15 members of the church and you got 600 joining? But we went out to the sea and we stretched our pastors out and they baptized. I would do the declaration and lift up my hand and 
15 pastors would baptize somebody. We stayed there all afternoon and baptized 600 people. There were another 300 who were ready to be baptized, but their tribes were afraid of the sea. So Saturday night, we took them to the small churches, divided them up, and baptized them in pools. And the next day, we had almost a thousand new members of the church. And that was a wonderful day. But that was not the best. The best is yet to come. Amen. I've been in some great meetings. In fact, uh, the one that you know most about is the one that we call NET 2004. Anybody remember that? Yes. We, we put a name to it. We called it Experience the Power. Yes. Folks, at the end of NET 2004, I have it on good authority, the people who were, were charged with the responsibility of counting who, who, be, who got baptized, on that Sabbath from NET 2004, we baptized over 5,000 people. In one church, the pastor had gone on vacation and the people had come to see me on television, but there was nobody to make the appeal. However, a local elder who had been gone for years came back on that day and happened to be in the audience. So when I said, pastors, would you, would you stand up now and call for baptisms? This elder came up to the front of the church in Virginia and said, the pastor's not here, but I'm happy to take his place. And he made the call in that church for NET 2004, and over 150 people were baptized in that church with a local elder who just happened to be there on that Sabbath. Amen. That's a wonderful result, isn't it? Amen. But that's not the best. The best is yet to come. Amen. We haven't seen the best. I don't know what that meeting is going to look like after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. After the latter rain has started, we're going to have some meetings that are going to shock everybody. Amen. In fact, I don't know how we'll keep count. I know that God can keep count, and that's the only one who counts. But, folk, we haven't seen the best. You've got some meeting in the back of your mind, and you say, that's the best I've ever seen. Well, I got news for you. The best is yet to come. Amen. We haven't seen anything close to the best. God's going to pour out his Holy Spirit in latter rain force, and things are going to change so drastically. A small Bible study that used to be so depressing for you is going to turn into a shouting session because people are going to hear the word in just a few minutes and make a decision to follow Jesus. Amen. It's not going to be your, your power, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. And when the latter rain happens, we're going to see things that we have never, ever seen before. And I want to be in that. So I'm going to hold on. My, uh, well, yeah, this... My, my brother-in-law is a great fan of sports. And uh, one, one day I went to visit him, and uh, he was looking at a football game that I had already seen. And he would always brag about his knowledge of football. And it was way better than mine. But today, I knew I had him at a disadvantage. I had already seen the game. So we looked at it together. We got all the way down to the fourth quarter. And he said, Walter, let's, let's go out and have some fun. Let's go get something to eat. Because we can see how this game is going to turn out. I said, well, I don't know. I just got a funny feeling about this game. He said, what do you mean? Your team is lost and you know it. We heard the two-minute warning. He said, come on, man, let's go eat. We know that you lost this time. I said, well. Let's just wait. Just maybe something will happen. Because I remembered what happened in the game. In the fourth quarter, after the two-minute warning, the quarterback, you know how they do when they try to be poetic? And he turned that ball loose, and it went through the air straight, didn't wobble, like it was put on a wire. And the receiver was almost in the end zone. And he put up his hands like he had radar in the back of his head and caught the ball, and in the fourth quarter, that team won. 
So I told my brother-in-law, I said, man, I just got a feeling. He said, well, Walt, you don't know that much about football. I said, yeah, I know I don't, but I got a feeling about this one. <laughs> so humor me. Let's just watch it. And of course, you know what happened. He said, man, how did you know? I said, well, I don't know, man. I just, there was something about this game. <laughs> well, finally, I told him the truth. I said, man, I had seen that game before. He said, you dirty rascal. You. <laughs> so you already knew the end. I said, yeah, I did. But that's why I didn't change sides, because I knew the end. Well, you already figured that one out, didn't you? Amen. We are down at the end. There's some folk who don't know what the end is going to be. But you and I have looked in this book. We have read about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we know how this game is going to end. Amen. We know that this church will go out in a blaze of victory. Amen. Because things are going to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what I want to say to you is, don't change sides now. Amen. Stay on God's side. Amen. It may seem like we're not going to win but we know the end of the story. We've already read it. And I, I want to stay right in this church where I belong and hold my spot. Because if I leave it, somebody else might come to take it. I'm going to stay right here. And I don't just have a feeling. I've got fact. God has planned for a victorious ending to this story of the great controversy. This thing is going to be glorious marvelous in our eyes. But if you leave now or change sides now, you'll never experience it. I urge you not only to be here, but to be part of it. We know we're going to win. It may seem like we're outnumbered all the time, but when the Holy Spirit falls in the latter rain power, we're not going to be in the minority anymore because the Holy Spirit is a majority by himself. And all he needs us to do is to stay on his side, stay on God's side, and we'll be part of a, a victory that nobody will ever forget. And I'm going to stay right here. I'm not as, as agile as I used to be. My voice isn't as strong, but I'm going to do whatever I can do and stay in my place and stay on my job because I know what's going about to happen. Don't you know? Amen. Haven't you read the whole story? Do you know what kind of victory we're about to have? Right. We're about to have a victory that nobody else could ever imagine. Right. And all we've got to do is stay faithful to God yeah. and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and latter rain power. And we're going to see an amazing victory. Right. Your neighbors who thought you were crazy because you went out on Saturday morning instead of Sunday, and they're not going to laugh anymore Amen. because the Holy Spirit is going to change the story. And all of a sudden, your neighbors who thought you were a little bit addle-brained are going to figure out that you knew something that they didn't know. You knew about a power that they had never met. But friends of mine, when the Holy Spirit's power is poured out upon this church, we're going to see some amazing things happen. We're going to see scores. We're going to see hundreds. We're going to see thousands of people brought to Christ. And they're going to learn about the Holy Sabbath and keep it with joy. Amen. I remember the times when we used to be sitting around wondering which big preacher would join our church, and that would be the power. And uh, you, you know one name that we always talked about. I heard he's going to join the church. And when he does, things are going to change for us. Well, I got news for you. No big-time preacher needs to join this church because we've already got the power. And it will not come from some popular preacher. It's going to come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can do this thing with his own power. And he will. And all he needs us to do is to do our part. Amen? Amen. How many of you will just raise your hand today and say, I'm willing to do my part? Amen. Praise God. I don't see one hand that's not raised. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, We've come to the end of a camp meeting that has been so inspirational. The sermons have been so power-packed and information-filled. 
I have been impressed. My heart has been strengthened. My courage has been enlarged. And I believe that many others are just like me. So today, Father, I want to ask you, give us the impulse, the will, and the strength to stand up for Jesus. And let me, let me pray today, as I hope many of us will pray, Father, pour out your Spirit. In fact, if it be your will, let the latter rain start right now. Let the Holy Ghost be poured out upon us right now in this room. I don't know whether it will be, be the sound of a rushing mighty wind or cloven tongues of fire, but whatever happens, let it happen because the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us. And I pray sincerely that you will let it happen now, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year. Father, send the Holy Spirit in latter rain force right now. Let it happen. I know you can. I know you're eager to do it. So pour out your Spirit upon us and give us the power to finish this work so we can come and live with you forever. Do that, Father, and do it right now. That is my earnest prayer. And if you don't choose to do it right now, then do it as soon as your will allows. Because I want to see the day when we see power like we've never had before. I've been in evangelistic meetings when I thought, if I could only have two more Bible counselors, if I could only have another amount for my budget, we could do some great things. Well, the day is coming when there will be no need that is not supplied. And Lord, I want to be a part of it. And I would really like to see you start it today. So my prayer is not naive. It's just a faithful prayer. Pour out your Spirit upon us, Father. Cleanse us with your Holy Spirit. Make us ready to go back home with you. And then, Father, let us have the power to draw others to Jesus Christ. Let it happen, Father, not with other people, but with us. Cleanse us today. Purify our hearts. Take away those, those spots and blemishes and wrinkles and make us a church that's ready to receive the Holy Spirit. I have read that all of those of us who are using the power that we have and are obeying the Word of God will be, uh, will be eligible to receive the latter rain. So, Father, pour out the latter rain upon us. In fact, as we leave this place today, let us leave changed. Don't let one individual leave this campground or leave this meeting place the same as when we came. We thank you for the outpouring of your Spirit upon the speakers for this camp meeting. We thank you for the outpouring of your Spirit upon the leaders of 3ABN. And we ask you, Father, to pour out your Spirit upon every one of us. Make each of us an agent for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and for the gathering of souls to be saved in thy kingdom. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus for the sake of the glory of your name. And I ask you to make those changes in our hearts right this minute so that we will leave different than when we came. And I close this prayer thanking you for the answer to our prayer and for the empowering that will come when the Holy Spirit is poured out on us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>